Good evening and welcome to the January 26, 2016 regular meeting of the Town of Yarmouth Board of Selectmen. If we could please begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First up, public announcements. Anybody? Andrea? Good evening. Andrea St. Germain, School Committee, Dennis Yarmouth. Um, I brought a little present for you. You might see that in front of you. And uh, it's from the Rennie Center. The Rennie Center is a think tank. And Carol uh, Woodbury, my superintendent, uh, my, and myself attended a meeting there. Uh, last week, Thursday. And why I bring it to your attention is because this center uh, always has some very interesting things going on, and what they say sometimes is reflected in education. And they talked uh, extensively about the social emotional skills and needs and how critically important social and emotional learning is. And they also talked about the standards and how, we, how much time we spend testing our students. And we, we, they came forward and told us that Massachusetts is number one of all the 50 states as far as academic progress goes. Uh, and so they were very, they were complimentary to all the, uh, all the educators that were there but they are now looking at the social emotional needs. And the, uh, the era of standard-based reform focused, uh, has focused on academic outcomes, but they're looking at not only stronger academics, but a better way to measure social emotional needs. And I'd like you to turn to maybe page five, one, five, and nine. And the reason why is they focused on early childhood education. And if they're gonna be focusing on that, and the Department of Education was there, all the departments, and um, um, they're talking about how important education of children is from zero to two, those years that they're usually not in a preschool. And they also, why I said page five, is something that New Bedford is doing. It's a community-based effort to work with children and parents from zero to three. And uh, the third thing was a page nine, Boston Summer Learning. And they really talked extensively about what they're doing in Boston for that gap in our education in the summer. And uh, they had probably 1,000 students from 16 communities, 50 different schools, and they worked hard on developing a social emotional skills and outcomes and how it's so important not only for college uh, progress, uh, progress in adulthood, but all through life. And uh, why I bring that up is we have spent a lot of time on opiates and what we have to do and how we have to handle that. And I think they were looking at some of the, some of the needs that way. Uh, last night we adopted a tent, the school committee adopted a tentative budget and we pared it down a little but we're still working on it. And at this time, as usual, the budget is a little high, 57,812,000. Um, I'm bringing this second thing up about a surplus vehicle because I noted, uh, sorry that Norm isn't here tonight, but he talked about how we're disposing of a vehicle. This vehicle is two, uh, 2001, 15 years old. It has 135,000 miles on it. Our student enrollment right now is from Dennis 33.1%, Yarmouth 66.9%. Uh, today, we have 23 students coming to our school from Spain, along with three teachers, and there are uh, three teacher chaperones at the high school, and that's another part of our exchange program, and some of our students will be going to Spain in the future, and we'd like to thank our teachers for all the effort. Um, recently, Cape Cod received a $500,000 grant, and DY is using $39,000 of that for planning purposes and a needs assessment for early childhood education. Tomorrow, the MSBA will let us know if we do have the money to repair manatees. 
which is in desperate need of a repair. And um, a few weeks ago, oh, I guess, uh, one of the members here brought up the fact that we had an app um, that was a rated of four plus uh, with Apple, and we looked very hard into it and talked to Apple about it, and they have since removed it and revised it, and I just wanted everyone to know that we are really on that because that app was inappropriate. I uh, yesterday heard from Larry Azar, our finance person, that we will be having to pay for the septi uh, septage disposal service, which is, I guess, that your department figured it was about 12 cents per gallon, which would be $19,000 more for the school budget for the full disposal, we would have to pay the full disposal as of FY 2017. And I was just wondering if, in fact, all the other agencies, uh, you know, the, tele, uh, the police, the fire, senior citizens, all those other agencies also have to pay for septage disposal. We hadn't in the past, and that was kind of a forgiveness. And that was one of my questions. And I'd like to leave you with that um, quote that I heard yesterday, if we don't make progress, we lose ground. So on the behalf of the school committee and the students, thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Rita? Uh, I truly wish I didn't have to bring this, uh, bring up the subject again, and that is uh, with regard to the uh, Newtown uh, administrator uh, selection. Uh, I think there was something rather smelly about the process. On the night that this board voted to appoint the Newtown administrator, the room here filled up with heads of departments as though a clarion call had gone out for a coronation. Someone must have informed those people that it was in the bag for Peter Johnson Staub, so they showed up first to celebrate. Unlike the recent turnout for the sailing coach, this was not a spontaneous gathering. As the shock of the unexpected vote set in, there were some peculiar comments made by some members of the board that night. One being a not particularly veiled reminder of the upcoming election in the spring that might carry certain consequences. Just perfect. But the two board members who took a principled stand on the merits would not budge. So apparently it became necessary to orchestrate a circling of wagons, beginning with a startling announcement from the chair of the finance committee that no more funds would be forthcoming for a new search that the board had voted to initiate. What is this? holding the board and taxpayers hostage? I would think they're on pretty thin eyes here. Then the coup de grace came from the chief in full regalia presenting a petition from the heads of town uh, departments in support of Peter. Unfortunately, this is not the first time that the chief has inserted himself into controversial issues. I referred for one to an earlier incident involving rezoning along Route 28. If there is one office in town that requires its head to remain neutral in political dust-ups, it is that of the chief of police. Somebody needs to remind uh, Mr. Fredrickson of this before he damages his reputation irreparably by taking sides. After all, this had nothing to do with safety or security, at least not yet. Oh, I wonder, was he in full regalia when collecting the petition signatures? For those involved, the unseemly pushback just serves an um, as an unfortunate counterbalance to the principled stand taken by the two members of the board. If anyone wants further information, I suggest that you view the two taped interviews. So now we, uh, we have to ask what's behind this unprecedented uh, action of, uh, or actions of town employees. Some people are beginning to wonder if there is something that someone in the town administration does not want an outsider to find out. 
Why else all this fuss? I urge this board to immediately reinstate a new search. But first of all, you have to appoint a brand new search committee that doesn't include any town employees, former or current. It should be people who have everyone's best interests in, in mind. We have plenty of those, some with volunteer service for the town in their backgrounds. By the way, uh, what exactly does the search committee do? Do they interview uh, any uh, anybody, any of the possible candidates? Yes, they do. Well, I'll tell you, the way things went, one has to wonder if somebody in, during those, that process might have whispered something somewhere, hinted in some way to some of the other uh, 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 candidates that you're possibly wasting your time. I'm not, uh, I, I'm just raising this possibility. And that's why I think you, you really need a totally new committee. And speaking of clarion calls, the one issued by the Cape Cod Times editorial board last Friday doesn't seem to have uh, resonated with the townspeople, at least uh, tonight. Thank you. Tom? Good evening, thank you. I want to make sure I speak closely into the microphone so everybody can hear me at home. Thank you very much. On our anniversary of uh, last year's superstorm, today we have 50 degrees. Not so bad, huh? Pretty good. On that note, the uh, public works, our dynamite plow workers did a great job over the weekend. I believe we did, uh, I got 10 inches over my place, and so I think the rest of you are with. Maybe Norm's house didn't get it, but. Um, we want to thank those folks. We also had a little fatality over in Yarmouthport, and I hope that person's okay about getting hit by the plow, and that was a kind of a crazy thing. Dog was in the road, but hopefully everything will work out. Uh, one note, we do have our St. Patrick's Day Parade coming up. It's uh, going to be March 5th. We have a fundraiser at the Irish Village on February 13th. It's going to be uh, quite a thing, our 11th year this year. Imagine that. Uh, we had a nice... St. Patrick's Day last year with the help of the uh, governor at cleaning the sidewalks. And then my last uh, issue is the uh, town administrator. Um, I had a lot of people come into my facility at the diner and want to know what's going on about the town administrator. We seem to have a perfectly qualified candidate uh, that's been in the town for a number of years that actually knows the town better than probably some other people and yet it just doesn't seem to work because of maybe some inexperience, but you know, inexperience comes with people giving uh, people a shot. And you know, I had a shot 20 years ago on Ford Motor Company, and I'm sure you folks on that table up there had a shot, and that's how you get experience, and you, you grow. Now, the assistant town administrator eight, 10 years ago was you know, a different person. I wasn't the same person 10 years ago, and neither will I be the same person 10 years from now. I mature, I grow, I forgive, and I move on. It doesn't matter what happened in the past, we happen to have a candidate that is very IT savvy, which we need, okay? We gotta keep the youth in our government. We can't have a person come in here for four years and then retire. We just did that. We want someone that's going to be a little bit longer, that has the technology within his grasp to run this government. It's not easy. We have to have someone that has the passion. The candidate from out our borders, in, in his minutes, said he didn't have any passion anymore. I don't understand, and these people that came into my diner, they don't understand. These are my customers, these are our citizens, these are your constituents that have a problem with what's going on with their stalemate. We need to make the interim permanent and focus on getting an assistant. So if something happens to our town administrator, we have someone that's gonna be able to back him up. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Suzanne? Uh, 
Uh, good evening, Suzanne McAuliffe. I'm here uh, giving a brief report from your um, Assembly of Delegates. Uh, I'm your re uh, Yarmouth representative to the county legislative body, which is the Assembly of Delegates. We're starting our budget process right now. The uh, commissioners are reviewing the budget, uh, and I wanted to just uh, say this process will take probably till May. The uh, Assembly of Delegates in its subcommittee format reviews each and every department in the county. I know there have been some concerns about financial issues, and I wanted to explain this again to the public. Our past uh, administrator for the county, who was both finance and administrator, uh, operated the budget in a way um, that is legal, but was not necessarily in the best fiscal uh, way. He would uh, use reserves to fund operating budgets. And because we have a lot of state property, a lot of reimbursements would come in a year, a year and a half late. So we always had cash coming in from state reimbursements. So we had always had cash. He always had the authority to borrow to pay for things like capital projects, but never did. So as a result, the county was left with a seven to $8 million debit to itself. Not illegal, but it is the right thing to do to pay it back. So this, uh, the county will be working out a program to uh, bond and to uh, pay back this money to itself. Uh, and this is uh, uh, part and parcel, thank you to uh, Bob Lawton, our former town administrator, who was the one who came in, uh, worked on the budget, and was able to um, kind of get these things squared away. So I want to thank Bob for his extra work on that. We currently have now have a permanent um, director of finance. Her name is Mary McIsaac. She is outstanding. And uh, there is also a search for the county administrator in process. Uh, unlike Yarmouth, uh, uh, they or like Yarmouth, uh, their first um, administrator search uh, was not successful because of lack of candidates. However, they do have uh, candidates now. Uh, and this takes me to my second item, which is the government. Uh, the government, the county government has been under fire. Um, and I think it's because of a lack of leadership and the dearth of a county administrator for the last year and a half. I think that that leads to people kind of not really feeling in charge, people kind of doing their own thing. I think it, uh, uh, th things do carry on, but I believe that, and we have excellent staff like you do in town, we have d uh, excellent department heads, but I think it, it uh, can create issues that are not there when you have a strong administrator in place. Uh, and I don't think it's the structure of the government which has been uh, uh, in the press a lot. I think it's the people. I think the people are either not following protocol or operating on their own or carrying out their own agendas. And I think that a, a, a strong administrator will help that. Fire Academy is an issue. Uh, and uh, it's been in the news. There is a report. It just came out last week. I can send it to you electronically. It's 29 pages. Or I can get you a hard copy and drop it off here, and you can have it, have it uh, copied for, for your uh, own uh, perusal. The reason I bring this up is Yarmouth uses the Fire Academy for, uh, if you go through the use, th one of the major towns on the Cape for use of the local fire academy is Yarmouth. So if we don't um, pay attention to what's going on at the fire academy and they shut it down, it's going to directly impact your budget because you will be having to do a lot more off-Cape expensive training for firefighters. This is a lot of ongoing training, not the big initial training that they do uh, when they first come on the department. So um, I will keep you posted on that. And I'm going to take off my assembly um, hat for a moment. I'm going to speak to you as a resident of the town of Yarmouth. I hope that the board can come together to resolve the administrator issue. Ha personally experiencing what it's like to have interims and not have a, an administrator in place creates um, a problem in a governmental structure. There are many good people who have worked long and hard to get Yarmouth in the best shape that it can be, that we have outstanding department heads. We put together uh, a good search committee. We have the recommendation of your immediate two previous and only town administrators for a recommendation. Uh, you have the power to do annual performance reviews. You have the power to not renew contracts. And I think it's incumbent on this board to come together and to 
do what's right for the town and keep the town going forward and not let it fall into a six month or 12 month morass of trying to find a candidate and letting um, uh, department heads get nervous and people not wanting to stay, I think you would uh, do a lot of damage to, to a town that's in great shape. And I hope that you can come together and uh, at least if it's only for a short contract, do something that keeps the town going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Anyone else from the public? Mr. Colby. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jeff Colby, DPW Director. Just wanted to give a brief uh, storm update. Uh, we faced yet another blizzard between 12 and 15 inches of snow uh, starting Saturday and going into Sunday uh, with minimal wind and power outages. So that's the, the good news. Uh, this was our first storm with the additional contractor support since getting the board's approval for that uh, effort this past year for a more robust snow fighting effort. Uh, there were some highlights uh, for those improvements. Uh, three supervisors, which served as our inspectors, were available for troubleshooting and response to issues. That was a, a certainly a plus over previous uh, seasons. All plow routes were covered with dedicated resources. So a single driver didn't have to cover multiple routes or supervisors didn't have to cover those routes. So it worked out very well. Significant improvement in time to complete the plowing operations occurred. So that was uh, significant and, and helpful. Uh, we have a tracking board that was also extremely helpful in identifying uh, resources and plow equipment where it was and, and when it was uh, uh, moving and in place. That was uh, certainly helpful and an improvement. Our new equipment, uh, led by a skid steer mounted snowblower, performed very well, uh, resulting in a quicker sidewalk cleanup effort um, as well. Some elements of the plan uh, were not fully implemented uh, this time. Uh, one of those was a lack of the four uh, front end loaders. That was the quadranting operation uh, that we talked about. Uh, it was some challenges there, um, some routes that needed to be covered. Uh, but there was one loader that was available that was not dedicated to a plow route that was able to help out and, and do some digging with the bucket. That was a significant improvement. Our goal for the next storm is to have two of those loaders available and working towards that uh, four loader um, arrangement that we talked about. So those are improvements we're looking forward to uh, moving forward. Equipment issues, there's, there's always equipment issues in a storm. Uh, this particular one, there were two contractor issues initially with all the new contractors and commitments. Uh, two of those didn't uh, pan out. And then further into the storm, uh, two contractor breakdowns occurred, but we still were able, to, with the resources that we had available, cover those routes. Uh, what I'd like to say is we'd like to continue to promote the tools that were in place, uh, the request tracker and the notify me. With the request tracker, we had a handful of users. And with the notify me, we had 168 subscribers. They got uh, notified as far as when sanding operations were occurring, uh, when the plows went out and, and updates uh, during the storm. So that worked very well, but I'd like to you know, certainly let more people know about that so we can have more take advantage of that. Uh, the other item with the request tracker, also a very important tool uh, that people can use. Uh, rather than just picking up the phone, they can uh, either, um, they can go on the website, uh, log on, and send in a request that goes directly to a supervisor as far as an issue so it can be dealt with uh, in a timely manner. So there were some improvements and we're moving in the right direction. Um, as you heard tonight and I've heard uh, throughout the week so far, uh, the significant positive <coughs> feedback, which is good. So I think that uh, plan's been well received. And I would like to thank the board for supporting this ro more robust uh, effort. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. On Coleman. behalf of the residents, you guys did a great job. I heard uh, a lot of positive feedback and I was very happy with the way the town looked. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? Seeing none, I will turn the meeting over to the licensing chair for our public hearing. Mr. Stone. Thank you. <coughs> Work top of the Cove LLC. Is anyone here to want to come forward, please? <coughs> Could you identify yourself, please? My name is Kevin uh, Richards. I am here with my partner, Kathy Giano, who's in the back row. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to meet and address you. Uh, we're very excited to hopefully be a part of uh, the fabric of Yarmouth and, and provide a wonderful service uh, inside the tremendous Cove uh, uh, Resort. 
Michael Edwards is kind enough to be here as well tonight, the director of operations there. Okay, before you proceed, I'm going to have to read the uh, notice into the record, and sure. then I'm going to let you... Um, Whatever you want. ...do your presentation. The Board of Selectmen, acting as the local licensing authority, has received an application for a new annual all-alcohol in, in-holder and weekday and Sunday entertainment licenses from Rourke's Top of the Cove LLC DBA K2's Beachstro, 183 Route 28 West Yarmouth, Kevin Richards, manager. The premise is the restaurant located inside a timeshare resort with 229 guest rooms. The resort has two floors totaling 62,214 square feet with indoor and outdoor pools. The restaurant has two entrances and four exits. Entertainment will consist of live and recorded music, live band with up to three pieces, dancing by patrons and or entertainers, amplification, movies, theatrical exhibition, and TV between the hours of 5 p.m. and 12.30 a.m. daily. Hearing will be held on Tuesday, January 26, 2016, in the hearing room at the town offices, 1146 Route 28 South Yarmouth. The Board of Selectmen meeting begins at 6 p.m. Written comments will be accepted until 4.30 Friday, January 22nd, 2016, in the Selectman's Office at Town Hall. Verbal comments will be accepted at the hearing. Okay. Well, again, thank you very much for a, a chance to uh, address you. Uh, we're very excited and very nervous. Uh, it's an important night in, uh, in, in our lives as a couple and a family. It's an important thing to us. Um, Kathy and I have lived in the Cape for almost 30 years. We live in Marston's Mills. Um, Kathy's 20 years experience in the banking industry. She was an officer with the Boston Company and was one of the founding partners of Giano and Friedrich Cunning Firm here on Cape Cod. I have been in the um, restaurant business for 40 years this year. Uh, very fortunate to have been trained early in my career by some of the best corporations. I work for the Back uh, Bay Restaurant Group, uh, the Hilton Corporation, the Marriott Corporation. Uh, culminating in my uh, last couple of years, I was fortunate enough to be in New Orleans where I worked for the Commander's Palace, which is the um, one of 75 restaurants in the world to have the Grand Crew Award. It's in the uh, Culinary Hall of Fame. It's in the top 10 uh, restaurants uh, in the world every single year. It's currently ranked number seven this year. And it was quite an honor to work there, and it's the only reason I left the Cape was to get that experience, and it was a blessing. Kathy and I have owned several businesses together. Uh, two of them were seasonal restaurants here on Cape Cod, uh, the Bonacle across from uh, Craigville Beach, uh, and also um, the uh, Calmus Beach Snack Shack. We also had a construction company, a remodeling company in downtown Boston for uh, over a decade. It's always been our dream um, to have a full-service restaurant here on Cape Cod. We have looked around um, for a long time f for the right opportunity, and are absolutely feel blessed and honored to have uh, been awarded the contract at the Cove. Um, they're amazing partners. They have worked really hard to have a ph phenomenal deal with us and really um, welcome us as partners. and. and and encourage us to have a, a, a strong entity there. We're going to open a fast, casual, uh, contemporary American cuisine restaurant. Um, our f number one goal is to be an amazing amenity to the Cove. The Cove is a great resort, and it, it's been suffering without that. That's our number one goal is to be a great amenity for the Cove, first. Second, we think it could be a phenomenal function room. It's a very nice room, and, it's, and it lends itself to that kind of energy. Uh, we're doing extensive uh, renovations in conjunction with the Cove, uh, a lot on our own and some with them. Uh, part of their being very gracious in the putting this plan together. It's going to have a total new look. It's going to be a lot of times in the past, it was kind of nightclub-y and all that kind of stuff. We're not interested in any of that. We're interested in being a nice family restaurant. Um, Great Cove amenity, then functions. We'll have weekend entertainment 
Friday and Saturday night, starting at nine, going for like three hours. We're talking two piece bands. To give you an example, we've already booked our, if we're lucky enough to get the contract, our New Year's Eve band for next year. It's called Too Cool. They're a two piece band. You've probably seen them. So we're looking for just, you know, music for people my age, you know, in the 50s and, and that kind of thing, and just to accommodate the cove. Uh, we're very fortunate. Our executive chef is our Amber Hempstead, very young, um, creative, and already accomplished chef. She was the executive chef at Lynx inside the Ocean Edge Resort. Uh, we have uh, a number of professional uh, front of the house people as well that want to be part of our team. Over our years in business, we've got some great relationships. Um, and we're just, you know, we're excited and we're all in. You know, this is um, everything that we have, we're, we're putting into this and we're going to be there 24-7 uh, on site every single day. We are uh, hands-on managers. Um, on the Cape, I've managed everything from nightclubs back in the 80s called G. Willikers and Tingles, uh, all the way to just as someone when I first came back uh, in Brewster, I, I managed a restaurant called The Dance as a general manager. Um, never, ever, once, ever uh, have had a liquor issue with any uh, property that I've run, have had tremendous relationships with um, the police and the licensing boards. Um, don't care to over-serve people, don't care to uh, serve people underage. Uh, the, the, there's, we're going to be hyper-vigilant on that. In fact, after this meeting, we're meeting with Sergeant Renzi at the police station. He and I have played phone tag for at least two weeks. Um, and we're meeting after this meeting. Um, I was lucky enough to, uh, Mr. Murphy, Tom Murphy, a week ago uh, sent us all the 12 pages of the loss, the liquor loss for Yarmouth and the four pages of revisions that are proposed for the February 4th meeting, which we intend to be at. Uh, so we're very invested in that. You know, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna well, I'm TIPS trained, uh, allergen certified, surf safe certified. Um, we wanna run a respectable establishment for families, no issues. And you know, we wanna be a good partner with the Cove, with the town, and with the licensing authority. Thank you. Okay, before I go to the board, um, does anyone in the audience wish to speak in favor of this application? Good I evening. Do. My name is Michael Edwards. I'm the general manager at the Cove at Yarmouth Resort. I have been at the Cove for, uh, it'll be 24 years in April. Uh, the Cove is going to actually celebrate its 30th year uh, in April of this year, 30 years young. Um, I think Bruce can contest is probably the, the most tenured department head about the history of the Cove. Um, I've been through two tenants at the resort for operating the restaurant. Uh, I'm very enthusiastic about um, Kevin and Catherine um, coming into the, the property. The board has negotiated a, a very favorable lease on both sides. Um, we're committed to investing a certain amount of money into the new equipment in the restaurant, which um, was desperately needed, as probably agreed upon by the Board of Health. And uh, you know, the, the the Cove is a great property. We work well with all the town departments, um, and uh, it's an amenity that serves 12,000 owners. Those 12,000 owners that own at the Cove infuse a lot of money into the town of Yarmouth, but they're also looking for a convenience factor while they're on property and they're in residence. And so I, I give my full support um, for this and uh, I hope you do so as well. Thank you. Does anyone in the audience like to speak uh, in opposition to the application? Okay, seeing none, we'll go to the board. Does anyone have any questions? Um, Tracy? I, I just have a couple of questions. Um, Certainly. Have we received the about our notifications? I have them right here. My apologies. That's okay. In okay. the application, there's a few things that say that are still in process as far as your um, insurance and your TIP certification. You I said your TIP certified. It just I hasn't been it. turned into the town. I okay, have perfect. It right here. I just want to make sure we get those. And we. Um, what do you have there? The TIP certification? That's my TIP certification. I always print. Did you pass that into the town yet? No, uh, okay. Linda told me to bring it here. Okay, you can give it to you. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. 
what was the other? Uh, your insur insurance was still in process. Yes, we have. Uh, have Kathy can probably speak yet? better to that. We That's have okay. uh, contacted uh, our insurance company, and Linda said that by the time, if we got approved, by the time we were to get a license, we have to have that in place. Not a problem. Okay. We are. Um, I guess I'm unclear about the alcohol in terms of is this for a full property? It's it's an all alcohol license. So it's for the for the entire Annu annual all alcohol. Yep. Oh. For no, the, no, it's, it's, it's for, the, for this uh, location in the that. property. In the property, so not just in the restaurant section, but in for the full uh, resort. No, no, no. That's what I'm trying to my, figure out. My understanding is that the application is for the restaurant area on the property, not to be selling alcohol in the units or out any place else, as far as I know. I, I thought the application was a... Um, Begins with an L. It does say. Um, it does say for um, the whole. End holder. Land yeah. That's Thank what you. I'm trying to figure All out. All alcohol end holder. End holder. I'm sorry. End holder. End holder license. Yeah. Yeah. The, the only issue there is that they they have a pool, where people have drinks. Um, so that's we I was to, we were told to apply for an end holder's license. So I guess this is just a little bit different than in the past because. Um, most of the in holders that have liquor licenses are held by the actual inn or hotel for instance um, what our concern always is is to be sure that when you serve somebody who's over 21 that that alcohol doesn't get passed to a minor in um, you know outside of outside of where it, or yeah. outside of where it's supposed to be absolutely um, we are first of all we we are hyper vigilant on that we, we applied for the same uh, license that the former restaurant had, the Four Brothers Bistro. They also had an in-holders license. Uh, what is convenient about the setup at the Cove for um, having good <coughs> vigilance around such issues is that the, the fence, it's an enclosed pool, and it's an enclosed restaurant. It's the restaurant's up on the second floor, and it's its own, in its own little world. Um, the pool's going to be, you know, it's a, it's a fenced-in area. It's going to be a couple of hours every day where there's going to be some sandwiches and, you know, you know something, some food put out there. Uh, people order food, will come down, won't bring them food, and if they want to drink, as well. So in those two areas, we'll be serving, serving beverages, and they're both self-contained. Um, you can't get a drink without, you know, if you look 30 or less, you're going to get carded. Um, I'm going to sell you one drink at a time. We're not, uh, we're not going to be having any sort of shot machines. We're not going to be doing any, I'm not going to do, we're not going to do pictures of beer. We're not, again, we're looking to be an amenity for the Cove. And the way I see the Cove, it's a bunch of families. Now it's 30 years, the Cove, right? So you've got to, my feeling is it's either people in their 60s or 70s that are st original owners, or it's their children and their grandchildren. So we love that demographic. So we're looking to just, you know, if a family wants some wine and a drink with a meal, we want to give that to them. Whether it's at the pool, they want a frozen drink while they're having a Caesar salad with grilled chicken on it. Um, nice and simple. Okay. Bruce, do you know if the prior license extended to the pool areas? And you don't know either way? And in-holders would be for the entire property, as far as I remember. I guess it's just the diagram that's here is just the... Um, yeah, again, that was the Just same the uh, license that... Uh, yeah, but this is a new license. It's not a license transfer, correct? Right, I'm just saying, as far as uh, context or um, precedent, when we went, when we came to apply, well, Linda, who was phenomenal, by the way, and very helpful on several different visits, because uh, there was a lot there, um, she let us, you know, helped us understand that the right thing that we should be applying for was the innkeeper's in license, okay. and, and she pulled out the old file because she wasn't sure, and she said, oh yeah, the Colucci's brothers had an in-holder, and that's why we did that, and uh, that makes sense, because that's that kind of property, and so, you know, that's what we applied for, and it, it, it is appropriate for that property. Okay. But we're happy to do any kind of, you know, you know, rules that you want to do to you know, make sure things are tight and right. We're, we're, we're a partner. Um, unless there's any other questions. I have a, I have just, just, um, 
for clarification, there are several references to 193 seats in the paperwork, and the building department's memo makes reference to 194 seats um, per current certificate of inspection. Um, do we, what number are we going to use? I knew it was 194. I, you know, I, I'm happy to. S I, I can tell you this. I'm happy to say 194. If you feel that that's for for, for clarity, that that's fine. And if we need to amend something, uh, if that doesn't muck up the process, uh, well, we're happy to go down to 193 if that you know keeps the process smooth. Well, the floor plan references 193. The board of health references 193, uh, and the building department references 194. So, who who uh, has the last say? I guess is the question. I, I mean, he does. building department. Mm -hmm. All right, then the number is 194. And just to follow up on Tracy's question, I think, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm misunderstanding, can I come from anywhere on the property, meaning the entire resort, and buy a beer at your restaurant and leave? Mm -hmm. With an in-holder's license, you can. Yes. That is the intent of this license? That's what you, with any in-holder's license. I don't, we've never done, I don't know yeah, that we've, we have, have we? Yeah, actually, um, it was just, the transfer of management for, I don't know if it was um, the Clarion, I think. Clarion Inn. That we just did it there, and I remember the Hampton Inn as well. Mm. Eric, my understanding. Those are a, a yeah, building and a pool facility. The, the, the Cove is kind of like a neighborhood, isn't it? Well, <laughs> it's not the size as much. So I guess my question is more about liability because it's his license on his property. Um, well, it's not. Well, it's, well, it's the, the property Mr. Edwards property. is in. <laughs> Mr. Oh. Edwards, you, have, you want to make a – could you please come to the podium? I just – that's uh, – My question was just in terms of responsibility. I don't know how he can be responsible for what's yeah, going well, you know, on. I, I can tell you this. We, we Because of that whole chemistry, we are already poised to be hypervigilant about, you know, really who we serve look at to as far as already being – having had a couple. Because, you know – with this kind of situation, you know, or even in a hotel, whether in a timeshare, someone can have a couple of drinks in their room. I'm sure Mr. Edwards has dealt with this. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, you know, the previous two tenants, I understand this is a new license and it's not a transfer, but the previous two tenants always held an in holder's license. You know, there are 229 rooms, and the majority of the guests that go to that restaurant are going to be guests at the resort. Um, so, the ability to serve at the various outlets within the, the three, 13 acres, you know, is, is part of the resort experience. So that's why. Yeah, no, and I get that. But I it's also open to the public, so yes, yes you I know. I like to go in there, actually. Um, if you wanted to come to <laughs> dinner and have a you glass of wine, that like certainly is, there. you know, viable as well. Yeah. So, but, you know, it, it really is built as an amenity for the cove. I so. understand that, and I get that, and I support that. My question was just more because of the separation and in the in the the ones that we've seen in the past, and I don't know if I was on the board when Colucci came, but um, it was like, 2006. Like yeah, you have to be a member to use the pool, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So that, you know, the restaurant is in itself. You know, you you can't leave with alcohol anyway unless it's you know a, a bottle of wine and it's in a, a bag and it's got a receipt. So the only area that you know it becomes slightly fickle would be the pool, and that's only open to, and it's a gated area. Yeah, it's gated and locked. That's what was that when, I, when I tried to mention the beginning. It's, it's a comfortable security area, and it's members only. So there's no public ever coming onto the cove inside that pool area that's not a member. But and, and I'm not trying to bust your chops. I, I think you, you sound like you run a quality operation. I appreciate that. My my question is. What is to differentiate a, a resident of the Cove from a non-resident of the Cove from going in, purchasing a beverage, and leaving? One's going to go back to their unit. The other one's going to get in their car. What's, what's the difference? And whose liability is it if that should happen? Well, it, it, it's ultimately always his. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but the ability for an in-holder's license, my understanding, is to go outside the perimeter of the restaurant itself and be able to serve. Back in the day in 1986, there used to be a juice bar in the Racket Sports where they also used to vend 
alcoholic beverages. So it, it was broadcast all the way across the property from the main restaurant 600 feet to another separate building as well as the outdoor pool. So I understand new license, but it, it's, it's, that's the way it's always been just because of the type of the setup. Um, so it's his vigilance, it's his liability ultimately always. And so I can tell you as the property manager that that pool is always attended outside during the season. Um, so, and there's security on in the evening time till 3 a.m. So, uh, I mean, we have our act together. Um, I don't, I've never seen it in my 24 years, four years to be a problem. I don't think the police department would say differently um, versus a public establishment that has less control and you know, less supervision. The only thing is for him, and, and my thought, and this is just nitpicking, I'm with Eric, I mean, I support what you're trying to do. I just think, you know, if you're serving, and they say we're taking it back to the room, is your front desk clerk gonna watch them? Are they gonna be responsible to say, you know, you can't go out and get in a car with that? that that's quite a liability. Oh, we typically our, uh, typically our um, you know, it's contained where, you know, the owner or the person liable is, you know, like, for instance, the Hampton Inn. The Hampton Inn has the license. The manager of the Hampton Inn has the license. So, of course, their front desk staff has ownership mm -hmm. in verifying that um, it's staying within the, the building or where it's supposed to be. So I just, that's where the, that's where I find it might be an issue. From a liability perspective, we looked at this and addressed it, and it's the timeshare association at the Cove can't encumber all the homeowners with that liability, and they can't obtain a liquor license. We, 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 we vetted that out over the past year of not having a restaurant, and it was determined that the, the, the board just can't do that. Right. Even though they're a corporation, they just can't do that because it only pertains to the common areas and they can't encumber the rest of the 12,000 owners with that liability. Right. They just don't have that authority. Right, I understand. So Those, that's just it'll always comments. be a third party and it's, it's on their liability. Again, it's never been a problem. I'm not trying to uh, cause a problem. I'm just saying typically when we give a license, we, man we, we make sure that the person responsible for the license um, is the person responsible to make sure it doesn't get transferred to a minor and doesn't leave the property. That's always been the responsibility of the license holder. And we take that responsibility gravely. Okay. And we would, we're not going to serve anybody anything that we feel is even close to being, there's no upside to it. Uh, I, I don't need the extra $7. We don't want it. There's no upside to, to trying to do that. I think in the pool, I was, you know, and we're nervous too. Don't, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, we look at that, you know, and it is. It's kind of a floating thing. We, you know, we are the ones that are ultimately liable. So... You know, our whole life changes if we make a mistake and we're not vigilant. And so no one's more invested than us when it comes to being vigilant. And really part of the plan really is for Kathy and I to work the pool just about every day. Good. That's really, you know, the one thing that we've kind of zeroed in on is, you know, it's her and I at the pool every day. You know, you know, we have already made that decision ourselves. Also, you know, we were really felt okay because it was enclosed people could be in bathing suits you know they're having a drink you know we felt that it was something that you could really contain it wasn't like that someone's it's the same risk it's always been and as michael just said it's never been a problem there's never been a high incident of people leaving the cove and you know with a drink that they bought god bless you um uh, also it's the same risk that you know when people try to sneak a drink out of any restaurant and you know get in a car so um we will be hyper vigilant because it's our neck on the line. We like the fact that there's security at the cove. We like the fact that it's enclosed, and we like the fact that you know it'll be Kathy and I. So we hear you. And um, I move we close the hearing. Second. Uh, can you just before you do that? I have one question. Sure. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> How does that work with getting the drink if you're in the pool area? Is there someone there you order the drink from? Do you go into the restaurant area and get the drink and transport it back yourself? How does that work? Logistically, we thought that we would be in the pool and stay in the pool, and you could we'd have a very limited. Yeah, there'd be like a little stand. Yeah, there a very limited selection in the pool. Exactly, a very limited selection of things that you could get just at the pool. Um, you know, 
snacks, sodas, you know, you know. Strawberry daiquiris. Right. A couple of drinks. And we have like an island oasis machine, you know, make a frozen Maybe drink. somebody watching those alcoholic beverages all at the At all time. times. It really is going to be Kathy and I it, at all times. Um, yeah. I'm fine, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. You have a motion? Motion second. to close this, the uh, hearing. We have a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Motion Aye. to grant the licenses as requested. Okay, Jim has a motion to grant the licenses, second. the alcohol and entertainment licenses as requested. We have a second by Tracy. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Signum five is saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Congratulations. Thank you so much. We will work hard to uh, be a good neighbor and make you proud and never have any issues there. We're very thankful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good thankful. luck. Thank you yeah, so much. Really. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Stone. Moving on to our next agenda item, uh, Protect Our Cape Cod Aquifer presentation by Laura Kelly, Director. Are you Ms. Kelly? Good evening. Good evening. Can I stand? Is that okay? Yeah, you, you, might, you gotta pull it really close. Give give the people just we want to make sure we can hear you. Can you hear me all right? Is that close that's enough for you guys? That's okay. Much okay. better. Let's just give these people a couple of seconds to uh, of course. exit the back. Lost our audience. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Chief. <coughs> Thank you, Chief. Good Thank evening. You. Hello. I'm Laura Kelly. I'm the director of polkacapecod.org. That stands for Protect Our Cape Cod Aquifer. It's an organization created by local citizens to educate um, and hopefully change local laws uh, for the betterment of protecting our natural resources here. I wanted to start off by saying thank you to the Board of Selectmen here in Yarmouth. Last year I came through and asked uh, all 15 Cape Cod towns, and you are part of a collective, uh, to uh, not support the YOP 2015, which stated the use of herbicides for vegetation management along power lines. <coughs> Excuse me. So I come back again asking the same thing. Uh, that is my request number two. This evening I have three requests. Uh, two requests being paperwork, basically. Uh, the first request is for your board to support Dan Wolf's bill. That's Senator Dan Wolf's bill. It's Senate 478 which states that each town on Cape Cod would be able to decide what type of vegetation management plan they would prefer without the use of chemicals. Your support on this is greatly appreciated. The bill will be uh, up in July. Uh, at this point, this is the 12th town I've come uh, in front of asking this request, and 11 towns have said yes. So hoping for your support on that. The second request is, again, to uh, write against the YOP 2016. That's the yearly operational plan that Eversource gives to MDAR, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources, that states what type of herbicides they're going to be using. They sprayed 13 towns in 2015, nine towns in 2014, eight towns in 2013. They're on a five-year plan called the VMP, Vegetation Management Plan. So they're moving forward to you know, successfully fulfill their goals. Uh, in a situation where it's unnecessary to use herbicides to maintain vegetation, we live above an aquifer, and I think that we really have a responsibility to stand up against this. The YOP for 2016 is not out yet, so I ask the board to be aware that it should be, it should have been out in December, it didn't, hasn't come out in January. I will get in touch with you when it does come out. Perhaps you will even get it before I know because they give it to the towns. <coughs> there will be a comment period of 30 days. That's the time to write to MDAR and Eversource. Uh, after reading the YOP, I believe not a word will change. Um, but you never know. 
My third request is the big one, the first two being paperwork. This one is about taking a resource to court. I found a pro bono lawyer, Bruce Taub in Orleans. We took our resource to court on October 1st and won. Three abutters, we brought three abutters, um, and they are exempt from herbicidal applications. We believe stopping this is successful in court. Put it in front of a judge. There's a couple things that they're violating their own written regulations on. My ask, request number three, is simply allowing my pro bono lawyer to talk to your town council. 20 minutes, 30 minutes is what other towns have been doing. It can be by phone, it can be an open room. Every town does something different. Um, just to see if your town wants to move forward or not. It's really about education. It's about understanding the regulations and deciding as a town what you'd like to do moving forward. So it's kind of beyond me and, and uh, the Board of Selectmen uh, allowing this to go to lawyer talk from lawyer to, to counsel. Uh, that's all I'm asking is permission um, to have a discussion with your town council. Uh, the advantage, uh, just to describe a little bit more about it, uh, my pro bono lawyer, Bruce Taub, is willing to represent every Cape town uh, for free. Um, he believes that this will be a situation that needs to be stopped, and we believe we found the way. We just need support behind us. It is up to each town to decide if they want to use their own counsel or not, of course. The advantage of having Bruce is that he is familiar with the regulations on the state level, as well as the YOP, the VMP, the CMR 333. I mean, it's a language that <laughs> it's, it's quite dry. Let's just say that way. Um, the town of Brewster is allowing their town council to read all the written regulations to understand more about this. So, you know, there's money involved on that end. The only other financial um, thing I want to add is to file in court is less than $1,000. So if you were to choose my counselor, Bruce Taub, uh, really there's not much cost to the town if they wish to move forward in court against Eversource to stop herbicidal applications along power lines. <coughs> Does anybody have any questions for me at this point? Jim? What what is the is, is the case already filed in the Superior Court? Yes, October first, we went to court. Um, we summoned EverSource plus their three uh, applicator companies that apply for them. Um, two were there. EverSource was there, and one other company, Lewis Trees, showed up. Um, and our ask at the time was to stop all applications from the bridges to Provincetown. So when you read the paperwork, it's going to say denied. When you read it's a page and a half that the judge wrote, it took him six days to make a decision. He said, this is a tough one. He got back to us on October 6th, and he said the three abutters are exempt for herbicidal applications. There's two things that are really obviously um, uh, where they're violating their own regulations. One of them is about distance. There's no applications allowed within 50 feet of drinking water. So 50 feet is a private well, 100 feet is a public well. What about 50 feet to our aquifer, or 100 feet? I mean, it, it's not that deep. Uh, the other thing that was quite obvious to the judge was about um, easements. Every easement we've read, because I've been knocking on doors for many towns, dating back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, on to current times. Now, one uh, easement on the deeds of actual abutters, does it say with the use of herbicides to maintain vegetation? It all says hand pruning, uh, mechanical methods, and some of them even use the word only. So, you know, whether they go and change it, that's one thing, but it hasn't been addressed. So are they violating their own regulations? I, 
who's to say? Who, you know, we just want to bring this to light that it's unnecessary above an aquifer and we should be treated differently. The World Health Organization came out just this summer, as you know, saying that glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is harmful. It's a probable carcinogen. The New England Journal of Medicine backed that up. The third, world, uh, the third party testing on a lot of these herbicides is coming out that you know, what the actual manufacturer is saying isn't true. So where do we draw that line where we just accept what's given to us or do we start to stand up and protect our natural resources here? Garland 4, one of the herbicides they have on their list of five, kills oysters on contact. It's got wealthy up in arms, you know. It's things like that, like how long is it gonna take? It's been three years now. How does it travel? And of course, they say no, it doesn't. But then you look at what France says, it persists for 30 years. So <laughs> I'm in that middle position where I'm just a messenger asking for your help. Um, in terms of the, the legislation you talked about, <coughs> is that legislation going to supersede the Department of Public Utilities regulations, or is it going to be... Um, uh, not mandatory, but discretionary with the uh, power companies. So do you mean the first request? That would be uh, the Dan Senator Dan Wolf's bill, S-478, yeah. will give the towns the opportunity so it would become, uh, you know, state level acceptance. Uh, and they would... You know, so that means Yarmouth decides to go back to maintaining vegetation with mechanical methods. You can mow in Yarmouth. And in Dennis, they want to hand prune. And in Brewster, they want to use goats. It, it's going to turn into be this. Binding? Yeah, that's the, the question. Is it going to be binding? In the end, would be binding because uh, most of the. Um, I believe so. Uh, electric and utilities are exempt from town which is the problem that we're in exactly so the state overrides the towns this bill would put teeth in that for uh the municipality that's the game plan absolutely yep that's a good man and then there'll be a financial um issue to discuss when that time happens if it passes what is the cost difference now this is, who's gonna know right okay so you've got the town of yarmouth you've got you know, 26 miles or something on your power lines. I don't actually know. I'm just making this up. How much does it cost to spray herbicides year after year? And mowing was once every seven years. That's what they did in the past before they changed their YOP. So, you know, what's the cost difference? Is it going to be more expensive to hand prune? You know, who gets to pay that? I said when we had this um, discussion the last time, this was brought before us and we had the opportunity to talk to them. Um, that's that's what it came down to. It, it was less. This is a less expensive um, management plan. Well, and not only that, but then we had the clear cutting that uh, a lot of people were up in arms about yeah, because they awful. just clear cut the entire easement area. Which is what they need to do in order. So they do that a year before spraying herbicides because you're not allowed, and they're not allowed to spray anything that's 12 feet or taller. So they do a mass clear cutting, and then the next year they apply. Uh, a Mazapar kills, uh, it's a bud inhibitor, so it makes it so the plants uh, don't rebud. It takes three applications in order for that to happen. So they've been spraying uh, October for the last two years, uh, that time of year. So they've got to at least do this three times in order to be in, in their world successful. So how much is that equal? It's, it's thousands of, of gallons of chemicals. And again, in a situation that's unnecessary, I'm just asking for, for your support in all this. Crazy. Well, I mean, we've supported it before. I think with our the work that we have to do with wastewater and what we're trying to do with the groundwater, I think it's really important. We've talked about fertilizers. Um, I learned tonight, again, I learned a few things at that uh, Commission for Women had a hearing today. There was somebody there speaking about um, fertilizers can be uh, restricted on a town or a local level, but pesticides and weed control is a state issue, which 
I didn't realize that there was a, a difference, and, and this fits into that. It does come down to money. I support um, the towns having control over that and a public process when it comes to anything with our public utilities. Uh, we've learned time and time again, uh, whether it's zoning, when we talked about the, uh, when we tried to work with them with the substation, they really uh, have no interest in working with uh, local people and you can't look at the state with a blanket because the Cape and the single source aquifer uh, should be protected. I, I do though have, um, with just this information, I guess I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to, to really uh, sign on to it without having some review and what it means in terms of liability for us when you get involved in a lawsuit. I don't, I'm not sure really what that means in terms of us, and I don't mean financially. I mean just having us listed there. Um, so if something were to come down the road and somebody, uh, I don't know, sued, I, I just I would just want to make sure that we were protected. And again, I, I need to read the uh, full text of the bill, but um, I applaud your efforts. And the bill's only a page and a half. What's that? The, the bill's bill? only a page and a half long. It yeah. should be right there. There's a sample letter attached as well. I've seen that because I was sitting here when we um, approved that the last time. I, I'm, I'm in favor of that. Again, we don't know what this year's um, YOP is going to look like to make. To, I, I want. I would want to see that before we absolutely uh, approved yep. responding to it. Um, uh, yeah, um, absolutely. Michael, um, I think on the, <coughs> the, the on the. Senator Wolf's bill. All this really asks to do is that it be reported out of committee at this point. Is that correct? That's what this document says. We respectfully ask that the NR ENRA committee move forward and favorably report out Senator Dan Wolf's bill S-478. So it's not, it's not even a a full measure of, of support at this particular point in time. All, you, all they're asking for, the, the way I read it, is it gets out of the committee and gets to the um, the, f the full house the of full Senate. body, yeah, yeah. for debate and discussion and so forth. So I don't really. That that's not to say I might not support it as it progresses, but I mean that's all this says at this point in time. And to have the support of the selectmen on Cape Cod that are that this bill is representing would be uh, huge. You know, this is I, this I is why I'm that. here. And, and I and I get your point on that clearly, but I'm just I'm just saying maybe <coughs> to anticipate a little bit of Tracy's concern, so <coughs> this falls short at this particular juncture of full support of the bill. It's just oh, asking okay. that the bill move forward. And this is the full text of the bill, then. Correct. Okay, I thought it was just. Uh, um, pieces of it. I wasn't sure if it was. That's it. all it is. Well, more the more problematical issue is is joining a lawsuit um, <clears throat> that's controlled by someone else who we don't know really anything about. Person may be highly qualified. They may not be. I don't know. I don't. I don't know this individual. And I certainly <clears throat> wouldn't recommend that the town just join an effort without having some level of control over over defending the, their own rights um secondly i'm no expert in this field of law there's, there's always a possibility of counterclaims when you file a lawsuit meaning that the person you sue turns around then and sues you and is looking for some kind of financial relief or or whatever and i certainly wouldn't want to um, be one that puts the town in that position where you, you know, you, you join a good cause and end up costing the taxpayers some money. Um, that would be the, the reservation I would have with that. Uh, I guess in response, my response to your three requests, you know, I, I've kind of read the, the bill, uh, Dan Wolf's bill. I, I think it sounds like a, a, an agree, uh, a reasonable agreement, although the last paragraph seems to take all the teeth out of it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it says they can basically do what they want if they propose a plan and you don't agree to it. Um, you know, I think we have written, we have submitted a, uh, a, an annual letter um, expressing our 
um, desire to avoid using pe pesticides. We do that every year. So, and then I, I really don't know uh, from a legal perspective what to um, get involved in a, in a lawsuit means. So I would have to defer to my um, legal colleagues here to um, offer some advice there. It sounds like Mr. Stone at least is a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, well, there's a 93A claim in the complaint which uh, automatically raises the stake for looking for damages. But as I read the proposed bill, it's sort of like a 90-day window to see if you can negotiate something that's acceptable, including the possibility of the municipality expending its own money to do the work if the utility doesn't right. agree to do that. So. Uh, it doesn't appear from the language. It's it's you know it's it's important stuff, and I'm not trying to minimize it. But it doesn't appear from the language that this changes the relationship of the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Public Utilities in making these decisions if they choose not to negotiate an agreement. Which has always been a problem. Yeah, I mean. I don't want to transfer that obligation to the residents is what, you know. How do you feel about the lawsuit issue, Jim? Um, well, I, I think the lawsuit is interesting. I think what, what has come about is because they tried to go from the canal to Provincetown, uh, they couldn't demonstrate irreparable harm because the numbers of plaintiffs were limited. But to the extent that the plaintiffs had a claim, I think the judge recognized that possibility but hasn't, hasn't recognized um, that there's a general demonstration that meets the criteria of irreparable harm to get a preliminary injunction. So I, I don't know that um, it, it's, to me it looks like it's gonna be a very expensive case to, to put on if you're gonna to have to have experts that go the distance of the Cape to make this kind of claim. So, and it's not something that'll happen quickly, but. I mean, I applaud the idea that somebody wants to protect our water, but by the same token, I'm not so sure that the, the conflict between the utility and the rest of us is not going to be one that's easily going to be overcome by the residents because there's a lot of protection for the utilities. So each town is uh, just a, if I may comment really quickly, um, choosing to do things differently. So that time that we went to court was with the abutters. Uh, the town of Brewster and Orleans, what they're talking about is their own lawsuit, not connecting onto this one, but creating their own. So it would be more written for the town and the town's uh, privately owned land in that town versus abutters. The problem, so the the problem wording. with that is though, um, realistically, unless it's an entirely different plan, the court's gonna put all the cases together so that you could have different parties in the case, but if they're all on the same issue, they're gonna consolidate the cases, it seems to me, just because of they, because they're not gonna to wanna to have 13 or 15 cases with 15 different decisions. So all I'm asking is for my lawyer to talk to your town council about all these questions. You know, it's, it's out of, our hands the way I see the next move for each town and ultimately at this point Brewster is going forward writing an injunction and I'm hopeful that all the towns will follow will join you know so it'll be 14 towns follow that so at this point it's just learning it's discussing it's a half hour conversation it's you know what is this about it's all the basic questions of exactly what you guys are asking about today but letting the councils talk about it because we're not lawyer i'm not a lawyer we're not lawyers we don't really know um they would be able to you know have a more solid discussion if this uh board allows yeah, I, uh, I, I applaud your efforts, Ms. Kelly, but I don't know that we are able to adequ adequately respond to your three requests tonight, um, you know, based on a 
23-minute discussion, I think. Uh, <laughs> well, I mean, we've, we've done we've it done in the past. Number two. And number two, uh, but the problem is the YLP may change. But barring that, I think, you know, I'm comfortable going on record to whomever to say that, you know, we're concerned with the spraying in our single-source aquifer. Um, but isn't that the, the annual letter that we submit? Yes. We yeah. just need to do more is what we're trying to do. Yeah. You know, the annual letter hasn't done anything. We've done that for well, years. Like Wolf's, um, bill really is going to do much either. I think it, it looks good. But, you know, unfortunately, when uh, at the end, if it says then they can do whatever they want, which is exactly what they'll do anyway, and if. the way that it's written, as, as um, Jim described it, saying that it could be transferred to our costs if it's something that we negotiate and... Um, you know, it's more of a cost to them. It sounds to me like it's going to be put on us when it's their responsibility. So, I mean, I have no problem saying that, you know, I, I, I feel like it's their responsibility and they should do it. Uh, we, we don't have a town council right now, maybe, is, is, is some of the problem. Um, we have one, but he's um, semi-retired and we're in the process of um, obtaining a new one. So I don't know, Mr. Chairman, maybe we need to just give it a little bit of time and see how um, that plays May out. May I come forward when other towns have uh, done more and hopes that you will follow? Some towns are leaders, some towns are followers. You know, it's just the way it is. And if well, that's possible, I would love to come back. Yeah, I, I, I certainly would welcome you back. Maybe Thank you. Maybe in the meantime, Peter, a little bit of digging to find out. Do you have Ms. Kelly's pro bono attorney's name and information and paperwork in you. Can we, can we just maybe do a little bit of research as to what it means to be involved in this? Great. Sure, happy to. Okay. Can we get a copy of that decision that you referred to? It's on your emails. I sent it to you. You guys the should have it. It's the, the 26. The Spirit Court, is that in there? Correct. It is. I didn't see it. Correct. Sure. There should be three attachments of according to um our day that day yeah. um uh, one was yeah we have it okay i saw the complaint and i didn't see um, it. I saw the complaint too i think that this letter that's been prepared there's um you know we could take the text of the bill and um support uh the bill and ask them to look more thoroughly at making sure that the town's um have more teeth in this negotiation and that they, because sometimes when it comes out of committee, they still work on language. Sure. So. I think, I think the problem, Tracy, is, is that they're looking for something that they can pass. And so they've written something that looks good and it can pass, but it won't do much. Well, so I would, yeah, I, I don't I disagree that we shouldn't try, but I have a feeling that, that this was the, what they came up with that they thought could pass. But as Tracy said, the bill could be debated and amended over and over again, sure. and the final version well, we can, could look substantially different than... We can write a letter to the chairs much like this and ask them, in addition to what's here, to, um, you know, consider removing at the town's expense and to make it a binding contract that, um, you know, something like that we can... Yeah, we certainly... That would be lovely. I asked just one question. Um, I've, I bring forth ideas, uh, requests, options. Uh, if there are not things you want to follow through with, I understand. But please do think what you can do to protect your own citizens in this matter. You know, if, this, if these things aren't you know, good enough for whatever reasons, if you've got ideas, please push them through. Please move forward. Communicating with Eversource, knowing when they're coming to town, telling the abutters. There's so many problems. There's so many loopholes in the situation where you guys could stand up more and become more involved in this matter. Um, if uh, I'm going beyond, I'm trying to get to the state house. You know, um, MDAR says to me, Laura, our hands are tied. It, these are EPA. This is federally allowed, you know. So it, it it goes way beyond us. But if you guys could do more to communicate with EverSource and you know find out how much it costs in your land, find out 
when they're spraying, really. You, you know, things like that, that would be great. Well, our, our health director's here. Um, maybe these documents are something that also could be reviewed by the board, and maybe they have some, some ideas or suggestions that, that they could bring back to us, because these are very detailed things, like you said, and it takes time for somebody who understands the statutes to go through it, and it, uh, a lot of it is within the Board of Health. So maybe we can ask him to. Mm -hmm. Great. Great. I hope this is the beginning and we can continue this dialogue and um, perhaps we'll be back in a few weeks. Uh, we really want to push this forward to prepare for when the YOP is happening. It's 30 days. That's when we go to court. So there's really a window of time. So I'm going to all the towns right now in two months um, and just letting everybody know what's going on and everybody's getting involved. Really, you guys are the only ones that aren't just to let you know. So I'm hopeful to come back uh, when, other th when everything else is, you know, really the ball's rolling, let's say, and maybe you'll jump on and, and join the, the party. <laughs> uh, we'll <laughs> try to educate so. ourselves in the meantime. In the meantime that'd be lovely. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Eric, to that end, if, sure. you, if you like, um, Bruce is here, and as you know, they have been following this issue. Um, and with regard to the, the, you know, the question of what are we doing to protect our aquifer, what should we be doing to protect our aquifer, and how best to allocate our resources to that end. Um, maybe Bruce could provide a little context in terms of what the, um, the YOP, Eversource's YOP, um, looks like today compared to the past, but maybe even more importantly, um, how the, the right-of-way issue relates to the whole Cape Cod aquifer and all of the various um, contaminants and threats to the aquifer and, and how this one fits in in that broader context. Judge, like That's the issue one. on the easements, you, you're going to have to deal with the legal issue, which is there is a written easement that covers these uh, doc. I mean, there's written documents covering the easement, but right. also we have prescriptive use. And under the law, uh, you can modify the use of an easement if you've done it for over a period of 20 years. And so when you get into the issue, there may be a discussion not only about what the language of the document says, but then the issue becomes the use that the, that the utility has put the easement to, because those easements have been there for a lot longer than 20 years. In fact, the first ones were put in there back probably before 1950. So, I mean, th th there are a lot of issues, and I think the information from the Board of Health would be helpful t for us. And, uh, and I agree with Tracy. If, if we get the, the new annual filing, that gives us a starting point also f with the rest of this information for us to see what our position should be. Not that we won't support something, but how do we best support something? Great. If you wish to um, contact Bruce Tubb, if you, you've got his information, feel free to write him directly. That would be great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Thank you all as well. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. you. Too. All right. Next on the agenda is to close the ATM warrant. Can I just speak briefly to support Laura's actions as I'm a resident of Yarmouth Port? and I live close to the uh, power lines, so I am very concerned about spraying that might drift into my neighborhood. Um, so I do hope the town will look into this further. Thank you. Thank you. All right, anything notable? Uh, any notable changes from our last look at the petition, Peter? Yes, uh, there the uh, the list of potential warrant articles in your packet has expanded. Uh, the first one th to bring to your attention is really just a clerical matter: the Parker's River Bridge easements. Uh, there, we may need to do that in two separate articles for um, Town of Yarmouth easements and land grants versus private easements and takings. Um, and then there is a third, uh, sorry, a fourth petitioned uh, article that was omitted from the list last time. It was submitted before the January 5th deadline, and that is a petition to allow dogs on the beaches. Other than that, everything is as it has been. Dogs on the beaches. Everything look uh, 
All right, uh, everyone, anyone care to make a motion to close the warrant? The dates have passed. Well, I'm com I was confused. I saw a schedule that had the dates open longer into February for some reason. I'm not sure where that was, but I... So the, the date for submitting petitioned articles is January 5th. The date for closing the warrant is the end of January per the charter. Um, and then... The last meeting. Yeah, so this is your last meeting to close the warrant, but obviously these are just, you know, subjects and numbers, and all of the details are going to be filled in, and the recommendations are going to be voted. We have until the end of March um, as a practical matter in order to finalize the, the warrant to be printed for town meeting. Um, what happens if there is... Um, an override for the schools. Would that go within just the regular operating budget of number six, or would it have to be separate? Would just be on there? Yeah, it, it would be right within the the okay. operating assessment. That's how we've done it in the past. There is a, as you as you saw, a separate ar article for the schools for capital, so that if there is a, a ballot vote required for that, there's a separate article for that purpose. Do we have any obligation for a separate capital vote for the Cape Cod Tech because of their uh, constru potential construction? Not that we have heard to date. I, I recall that when we had last year, there was an appropriation right. for the stabilization fund, and that was done within the one article. Okay. I would move the... Uh, the uh, tentative warrant articles as listed on our uh, documents from 1 to 33. Wait a minute. 40. Uh, 40. 40. Sorry, 40. And uh, in accordance with the requirements of the Charter. And to close the warrant. And to close the warrant, correct. Second. Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstained? Passes unanimously. Uh, we're going to postpone the 815. Uh, Town administrator appointment uh, until February 9th. We don't have a meeting next week, so the 9th will be our next meeting. Hopefully, we'll have a full board and we can uh, have that vote. So that moves us to selectman items. Michael, any individual items? No. Tracy? All set. Jim? The only thing I wanted to talk about is, is that in the consent agenda, we had a letter from the um, cemetery ad hoc committee asking for us to do some clarification i'd like to just take that out of the consent agenda and to have a discussion about how we will respond to that if in fact that's the wish of the board didn't we do this last week i don't know it's no. in the consent agenda this week yeah why does it seem like i've seen this twice because we had email correspondence about it and now it's happening maybe hmm I think in a prior packet, it was there. It was in was a prior packet. Their, their it's information was included, as but, but no action was taken on it. Correct. Yeah, it was informational. The prior inclusion. Other than that, I have nothing. Thank you. So, all right. So let's. Is there a? Uh, a, a did you make the motion to approve the consent agenda with the exception of the? Memorandum from the Cemetery Ad Hoc Committee. I will right now. Second. <laughs> Any more discussion on the motion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed or abstain? Passes unanimously. Now getting back to the memorandum from the Cemetery Ad Hoc Committee. I thought that we had done this. And we talked and confirmed about that Confirmed yeah. their four bullet points. I, I thought we, at, that, at, that, uh, at the meeting when we had their presentation, I thought we did this. But if they're looking for some direction, I think because the amount of work they've already done, we should. I think the direction was limited to confirming that we want them to pursue these four bullet points. And I, I don't know, maybe I'm, it's. No, I, I don't disagree with you. I, I just, yeah. I think for whatever reason, they, they want us to let them know what they're supposed to be doing for the, se the second six month part of the appointment, so. Uh, and again, it's my belief that they just want to confirm their understanding as a result of the of the meeting we had with them. And those are, they, they want to confirm that we want them to pursue public outreach, research, signage, uh, incorporate recommendations into rules and regs and define ornamentation. Those are the four. I, that's what we've yeah. talked about. So 
even if we just say that's what we want. Exactly. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So. Do you want a motion? Well, I mean, is there any more? That was that was my understanding of the discussion. We just, you know, they are asking to, for us to confirm that we want them to pursue these four items, and I think we just need a motion to say yeah, yes. You know, we extended your <coughs> existence for an additional six months to for this purpose to accomplish these, this. Yeah. Right. So move. Is that your understanding, Peter? Yes, it is. Okay, thank you. Is there a second on the motion? I'll second it. It says they want written clarification, so... Um, we'll give them the motion. <laughs> can we give them a letter saying that we've reviewed this and we voted and the charge, the continuing charge includes those four items? Sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. All those, in, all those in favor of the, uh, of the motion with the clarification? Aye. 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 Opposed or abstained? Passes unanimously. My only individual item is to congratulate the, the Roby, who's in the back, and uh, her, her, her people and the DPW, Mr. Colby, who is here tonight. What a difference a year can make. Uh, <laughs> that was, uh, the snow removal efforts were um, no short uh, of amazing. And um, it's much appreciated, so. Only a, only a couple of <laughs> So that's all I have. Uh, town administrator items. Peter? I have nothing. Jim stole all my thunder. A motion to. And we already approved the consent agenda as yeah. part of Jim's. Right. Okay. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned.